um, talking about human-centred design. That was a, a beautiful experience. So thanks for having me today. Um, I'm from Artery. Uh, so we, we work with organisations to help them create strategies for change. And today we're talking about human-centred transformation. So I'm I'm uh, coming from a from a very human-centred design, and I know that we've had many of the conversations today uh, talking about customers. Uh, so so my work very much drives in from the customer perspective. So we'll be we'll be going from that lens. So. Uh, we are from uh, Canberra, Australia. So hello to everyone. I know there's been a few people from Australia already, so uh, it's good to be in good company, but um, we're hoping we get to uh, present ourselves to the world as well and show um, all the things happening in Australia. So thanks for having us um, today. Uh, I am a strategic designer. Sometimes I get called a, a CX architect. Um, I also uh, coach and lecture at University of Canberra uh, in design thinking. So I, I get the opportunity to, to do a lot of that good work of teaching people the ways of, of what we do um, on a daily basis. Uh, so our uh, agency, we're a strategic design agency. Um, we're experts in human-centered design, design thinking, and, and also we pair that with business architecture. And we help businesses navigate the chaos that often you go in and find, um, and we get them to, to confidently uh, unleash their true purpose as an organisation, really drive the impact to, to uh, those customers that they serve, um, bringing to light, you know, certainly for their staff an opportunity to, to, to start to um, really have purpose in their job. So it's really impactful and we love what we do. Uh, these these are just a, a few snippets of um, projects and things uh, I've been involved with over the years. Uh, often we're doing a lot of online workshops and things, but these are and often now in the, in the um, era past COVID or currently a lot of COVID around, but certainly more integration with people getting together. We're doing more workshops and things like this, but. Uh, we we sometimes getting people uh, doing different things like playing with Lego or um, up you know um, doing things on walls, taking people, staff, executives to immersion spaces. Um, the top right there is is with my students at the University of Canberra, really getting them to ideate and, and work through problems, and then working with other clients in big groups and and different things but sometimes it's just whiteboarding sometimes it's it's getting teams together but the the uh the key here is the engagement and bringing people together to drive the change through through teams within an organization so that's what we're really passionate about so today the agenda uh that i'll take us through uh so that human-centered transformation what does that mean what does that look like um, putting humans at the heart of a transformation what do we do some practical things about how we get that done um in that integration of um human-centered design and architecture what does that you know was that interact you know how do you make that happen and and what are those connecting points and hopefully we'll come away with some some thoughts and ideas um, for your own work and then a few tips on taking action where we think you could you know, hit the ground running and and some things organizations but also um, individuals can start to uh, take on as well so and we'll hopefully have some questions at the end because we're in the space of curiosity and uh, question asking. So I love being asked lots of questions. Hopefully I have something to, to um, provide you, but it's a great opportunity to unpack and, and really share some of those thinkings. Um, so why is human-centred transformation important? Like that's that's a pretty um, pretty important thing that I'm, I'm sure many of you can answer for yourselves. But that, look, we've got some... Um, uh, stats there below that you can read yourself as we go through but that adapting to ra rapidly changing markets so we are seeing lots of changes at the moment and certainly for our clients whether they're in um, private sector or public working with government agencies it's certainly uh, a, a time of change uh, so things are happening uh, through the environment um, in people's lives and and things that we're seeing so prioritizing that customer experience um, 
helps us in the digital world, helps us really unpack uh, how to move um, and how to understand into the future how it will change for customers. And that second one, meeting evolving customers' needs. Um, so aligning to the shifting customer expectations, building trust with your, your customers and clients is really important um, through the process and, and really should be the goals of um, the business and how they transform and, um, you know, pursuing what those customers are going to be in the future. Like how can we unpack and explore what that future looks like for our customers? Um, and using it for innovative problem solving. So using that design thinking approach that thinks about the, the, the customer, the user, the stakeholder, how do we use that to, to really think and get out of our, um, our, our normal ways of just getting things done and foster that design thinking approach. So, and looking for those new market trends. So we're, we, um, we're really passionate about doing that uh, and, and the human centered lens and, Combining that with um, design thinking really gets people thinking about the future. Um, so design is crucial for organisations and the future of our digital world because it prioritises the needs and experience of customers and staff. Key is staff as well. So we often talk about the customer experience, but it's about all the humans. It's about the staff experience and the customer experience, but it leads to more effective and accessible and satisfying product services and business businesses, even if you're a government department. Uh, design is a catalyst for innovation and transformation by aligning technological advancements and business value with genuine human needs. Uh, it goes to the heart of, you know, really at the end of it, tech is, is there to, to provide um, some value and, and that is often humans doing a thing. So, so we really need to use that in partnership with all the other capability um, views on a business. So um, I guess through my career as well, um, you know, I've probably started off in, in more that operational space of design and where, where it added value. Um, my, my background's in industrial design, so it was really around that product development, um, producing products for the, for the masses. But as, as we've moved through and as I've moved through my career, uh, design has, has become a really integral part of businesses and so it has grown so it's it you know it, it has been in that ui space of website design maybe comms and emails and presentations and things that we do at that low level and slowly started building out into this user experience um and that's where you know uh, industrial design certainly uh, was a good uh foundational piece for me and i worked in that space for 15 plus years before moving into more of those upper upper level um, strategic uh, design um, spaces. So that's where we, we go into IT strategies or business strategies and looking at the impact that those can have, even policy design and bringing that into a human-centered lens is really something I'm passionate about. Um, also the impact on social and community programs, sustainability is becoming a really important thing um, for, for countries and, and companies and individuals. So uh, something um, that uh, as designers grown up, I get to have grown up in my career too. So that's been really exciting. So um, at Artery, we're really passionate about putting humans at the, the heart of, of transformation and the way we get get our work done, how we, we enter into an organisation and, and do that. We've been lucky to work with some pretty um, amazing uh, organisations, companies, public, private sector. So uh, work with the Department of Health, um, we, we've been able to work with them on a number of projects, but also uh, um, age, um, age care and, and the things that we need to get to done for our um, ageing population or ourselves as we age, uh, we're trying to improve services there. So that's been a really important piece that we got to work on. Um, we are doing some work with um, the department as well in terms of disease control and, and, and the things that happen when things like COVID um, start to, to come into a, um, 
a, a country and the impacts that has and how can that organization solve those problems. We've also, on the, the right, we've also been, sorry, my light's just gone out. Um, we've also been able to work with um, some pretty big organizations, but particularly in the energy transformation. So that's uh, something we're really passionate about. How does a business shift and change to to the changing needs in certainly the the energy transition and, and moving to more sustainable um, energy sources uh, and electrifying um, households around Australia and and uh, across the the globe as we're seeing a movement towards that so that's really exciting um, from our side but we we enter those through that customer lens and what those need to be. And certainly when we enter into an organisation, we, we do a lot of stakeholder mapping. So we're really unpacking, first of all, from that stakeholder perspective, who are those stakeholders that we need to really consider as part of any projects? Um, this has been a, a project, um, we're working with the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry in Australia, and um, we've do been doing some work in the um, uh, regulation of um, agricultural exports and the regulation around that and how they need to transform from taking, you know, some manual processes, but even some digitised processes and uplifting that service to really um, streamline it for the department, for the regulators and for um, uh, companies, producers, farmers um, that are all part of that supply chain and how do we improve it so that businesses can get back to the job of cre creating their products and, and exporting. So that's been a, a pretty hefty um, job that I've been involved in in the last couple of years. Uh, but certainly we, we've unpacked that pretty thoroughly and looking at two sides of the coin. So often it's the, the outside in, those customers, stakeholders, citizens, and sometimes it's investors or all those people outside the business, business but also sometimes, you know, those um, organisations that sit around those. So here we've called out some some councils and, and organisations that play a part in the whole ecosystem. And we explore what's important. So you'll see some coloured dots there where we see them as important to the process. Inside out of that organisation, we really looking at, you know, the staff, the different roles, the complexity of, of that organisation, management, executives, um, government agencies. It could be the ministers that are um, heading up those departments. So it's really um, can be quite a complex uh, view. This gives us a little bit of a snapshot, but the the actual um, the the big stakeholder map was really complex with uh, different commodity groups across meat, dairy. Um, fish, you know, you name it, there was um, everything, plant products that we export as well. So it's a very complex space, but doing this allows to, us to really think about those different stakeholders and how we're going to unpack them. And the way we unpack them is, is thinking about their challenges, those things that are actually working for them, the delights, the opportunities and the goals. And those things, depending on the context of the project, can be about the business that they're uh, connecting with, but it can be about the individual and the jobs they're trying to do in their existence. So often we try and zoom into their world and think about who they are and what they're trying to do. This is just one example. So we 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 do a lot of these, but thinking about how we profile those individuals. Um, this was for the aged care work that we did, um, and unpacking the problems that were were brought to life. Um, sometimes it's going out and doing that research ourselves, and and um, having a team of researchers and service designers. Um, to go out and explore what is it, what do we need to understand about these people and how we can use that information to um, give it, uh, use it in, in terms of um, a strategy that we need, we need to develop. Um, 
we we sometimes call them personas, um, sometimes call them proto-personas. So if it's not evolved to a certain level, it's called a proto-persona and we have to uh, go in and sometimes do uh, more research. Other times we can get research that's been done inside an organisation already. So often there's a repository of, or there's a files of, of lots of research that's been done, but they don't know what to do with it and they don't know um, how it can be involved in you know more strategically in the business they might see it more as a a low level activity that they can they can use to, to as a user experience piece on a website or something um, but we really like to take those artifacts or, or build those artifacts for organizations so they can use it more strategically across the business in different ways uh, so integrating human-centered design um, and architecture so um, we see two sides of the coin. So there's there's the architectural world uh, in which it's, you know, those, you know, lots of different things, but enterprise blueprints, strategic alignment, organisation structures, um, process flows, capability mapping, that kind of thing. But it's really about the business and it's centred on the, that core of the business. And then the other side of it is this human-centred design, um, which we, we like to partner with the architecture. So unpacking that from the people, their needs, challenges, goals. We, it could be experience maps, channel strategies, those moments that matter for those people going along journeys, um, service blueprints, and often we're developing future state service journeys. So what is that into the future? But all those things, they need to come together um, to be in tandem, um, and they're both very important to those um, decisions and those investment um, decisions that that companies or organisations need to make. Um, so often if architecture without that design side of it, often it's too inward focused. So it's thinking about the business in itself and 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 thinking about the business as alone, whereas design without architecture is often not grounded in feasible or viable solutions. So really we need those two sides of the coin to, to interplay together. And sometimes there's um, tension with that. Um, but it's really important that that is part of that engagement and that communication and that you'll, you'll um, have an opportunity to, to look at both sides of those that coin. So um, in terms of the, the process in which we really um, drive home, it's that double diamond. Uh, people have, um, may have talked about these in, the, in talks previously. But using that double diamond uh, approach to really develop, you know, gain alignment initially, you know, develop that strategy and then move to the execution uh, phase is really important. We use it as a really structured way to take our clients through a process, but often upskilling them in, in, the, um, in the process of doing it. It's really important that they understand why that we're in different phases and what we're trying to do and make sure that they're on the the journey with us because sometimes if they don't understand the process they can lose hope um, of where we need to get to uh, stakeholder engagement number one like if you're not doing that as uh, through these projects and and we have called that out I know a few people have talked about stakeholder engagement and being able to talk to people and and the different architect roles being able to to have those conversations and and learn to to uh, do really great engagements really important um, so first of all we, we go into that sort of alignment phase where we haven't kicked off the project but we're just li aligning as a team and we're we're getting making sure that we've got those key stakeholders that need to be part of this early defining process whether it's executives whether you've got some really uh, smart cookies that you need to bring together to um, and the project team to really unite um, over the purpose and the objective of the strategy. Sometimes you've got an op opposing objectives and you need to understand that and what different people uh, want to get out of a, a project or a, a strategy piece. Um, we then go into that discovery phase. Uh, it is often that you're going into an organisation and you're doing a stock take of research that's been done before, but sometimes it's it's not. Maybe it's actually doing the research yourself, but understanding those internal and external stakeholder problems to solve, what are their jobs, 
what are what are they um, what are they trying to do? But also doing some market scans on what can what can be the impact that's facing an organisation. What are the challenges that they'll need to overcome? And then we get into that define phase where we're really getting down to what are the things that we need to solve for that that um, for that organisation, whether it's an external stakeholder and their customers, and what are the ch problems that they're having? What do those internal teams need? And often we're using the business architecture um, and we're framing up those value streams as we're moving along uh, this journey to really define and assess those capabilities because the research can bring us some, some of that information together. So really important that we're doing it in partnership with the, the business architecture architects. Um, we leverage design and business architecture methods in that design phase. Um, so we're doing scenario mapping. It could be uh, ideation workshops off the back of pain points that we've understood. Um, and we're developing a range of solutions. So we don't like to get one or two solutions. We like to go wide. So we're, we're in the business of really uh, divergent thinking in the way that people think about solving problems and using that tech um, as a real leverage for a business to to make change and 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 see the the future state and what could potentially be there, and um, we start designing that future state. What what could be the possibility with the opportunities that we can unpack through architecture, and finalising um, that we get into that delivery uh, phase where we're. Um, really identifying those capabilities to uplift that future vision, developing um, IT architecture, developing initiatives um, and, and prioritising those um, so that we can really invest in the right thing at the right time to build that roadmap. Um, and then it's the the implement and adopt, and we deploying that and hoping for the for the best. But uh, more and more, we're getting into that phase of implementation so that we can be part of driving that change because there's so much work in the strategy development that can fuel the the implementation. Certainly, getting teams on board with the strategy. How do we engage teams and bring them along that journey as we go? Um, key to this is that adapt adapting and, and measuring the impact and the benefits that the projects are, are having um, and, and having cycles of um, improvement and how can we iterate on that process and, and if something's not working, if strategy is not working, how do you pivot? Um, so this is kind of a really simple that complex view of the world that we see. So, so really we have those capabilities that, that feed our operating model and the, the way that we, we get services done. Um, and really unpacking those is really important. So that people perspective, um, but also the tools, um, the, the technology, the processes, and that DNA of the business that really goes into how we're operating to drive that customer experience. So that's very much how we see the world and how you create traceability back into those um, capabilities and where you need to shift them to, to invest and uplift. Uh, so that's a little view of that and how we look at it. So this is an example. Um, it is a value stream map that um, with a capability assessment that was done for the uh, Department of Health, I believe. Um, but thinking about um, this, it could be external facing value stream map, but thinking about your journey as well of a user going through. Uh, so doing that mapping first and then aligning it to, you know, that is a capability assessment. So doing that really hard work. And this doesn't always happen in the order that I'm going to show it, but it's really important that we we get the process right and how we we unpack this um, and bring together the, the design and the architecture. So we create, we use these capability assessments to understand um, where we need to target discovery research. So if we use this approach, we can actually either use the existing business architecture and assessments that have already been done to know where we might consider doing our research as well. So which areas of the business you know, are these capabilities coming from? Maybe going out and speaking to those teams, but also, 
um, just, you know, as we look at the external um, side of it, so the, the journey that customers go through with the business, we can also look at that and do customer research along there to understand the current state of the experience and where we're failing customers. And that may be linked really clearly in your capabilities um, as you map that down through, you know, your, your mapping that you've done from the architecture perspective. Um, and then as a business, we're often um, designing a future state um, experience um, through um, that can help businesses target their investments to capability uplift where it will have most impact and, and develop businesses that our customers will truly love. So really important that we do that approach. My light's gone off in my room, so hopefully the light's still okay for everyone. So taking action. Um, so with all that we do, uh, we're really passionate about this work needing to take action. So that any business that we work with, uh, doing the the hard work of the um, design thinking and that approach is really important. But making sure that um, a business can take action. But from the the that human centred design. Um, architecture perspective. We've got really, um, in terms of the way Artery uh, tackles these problems, um, we're often doing it with a, a team of, of different experts. So we, we are very clear that there's certain roles uh, that need to come together, whether it's inside an organisation or it's a, a consultant uh, consultancy that's coming out to an organisation, that there is uh, that multidisciplinary team that's going out that have different perspectives that bring that together. And so when we're setting up either a, a strategic team in, inside of an organisation, often it's with different roles that are going to come together and do that work. So it's the enterprise ar architect, strategic designer, IT architect, user researcher, and service designer. It can be other roles depending on the needs of the organisation, but we believe that it's really important that you get these different roles working together. Too often I have seen examples where you have a, a number of architects working together in isolation and the problem I've seen is uh, that they may not be connected up with the business. And I know there's been uh, points of this talked up in, in other conversations that have happened um, today, but it's really important that that, um, that work that the architects are doing when they're creating, uh, whether it's, you know, helping advise on, on strategies or um, advising on the tech side of things, that they're actually getting a view into the experience layer but also how we can bring these together in terms of engaging. So how you can use the service designer in terms of engaging with the bigger business in, in bringing that information together. So that's what we're really passionate about. The other thing we, we um, think is a great idea for an organisation is making sure that they're, um, they're using tools to really track their transformation and using those um, knowledge base um, tools that can bring together architecture um, perspectives but also uh, the the research knowledge together in a space that links it all up uh, to ensure that you can you can unpack the architecture and the uh, design input the, the research input to it um, so we've just got some examples here from capsify not um, we, people have used different tools here's some examples that i've got in terms of making sure, you know, your um, assessments of your capabilities, that you can actually link those problem statements that come out of research so that you do know that they're real problems and, and making sure that linkage is, is continually updated over time. Um, but also being able to map those capabilities. And, and I know there's... Um, there's some other views that I haven't got here today, which is more around the, the journey maps and how those capabilities underpin the journey maps. And there's some great tools that, that certainly can help teams um, do that. So I highly recommend um, using some of those tools. And then my last point um, is really about creating space, safe spaces for, for strategic teams um, at, in a first level. So this is um, an example from my, my university teaching. Um, 
but bringing together, and sometimes they do need coaches, they do need design coaches that can help the team work together and understand how they can actually um, bring the different perspectives together and do that thinking, whether it's, you know, online um, remote work uh, through through um, Mirror or other online tools or whether it's in person. And certainly when I get into organisations, it is about actively working with those different roles and I search them out. So if I don't have them, um, if I'm not brought into a team that has uh, an enterprise architect, I'm going to go hunt them down and I'm going to be become friends with them and I will um, uh, start to run my own workshops with them directly. So it's really important that we do that, but also creating safe spaces for those people to work in and and be able to to, to start thinking, creating like designers and, and not to be um, scared inside a, a closed space that they're getting out and that you're bringing other people into that process as well. Um, so that's it from me today. Uh, so I um, hope you've um, taken something away. Um, please reach out to me if you'd like to connect or, or to um, learn some more about what we do. Um, I'm online on LinkedIn, but I'm also um, you can catch us on the, the website or over email. So that's it from me today. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. Um... We did uh, get a, a hi from Heidi. <laughs> it said, uh, nice to see you. <laughs> um, yes, it's good having so much Australian content in the, uh, in oh, the agenda. Great. Um, just uh, a couple of questions. Um, uh, the um, the human centre transformation concept, is that something that you're finding the market is now asking for or is this uh, something that you bring into the organisation? Yeah, it's it's more that we bring it into the organisation. So it's certainly uh, going in, and, and we found it quite interesting. So sometimes, uh, depending on how your your client uh, views the world, they, they may see architecture as a really important role and that in their mind, that's what they need or the business architecture and how they're going to execute it. But then we, we go into an organisation, you end up doing human-centred design anyway. Um, but we we often uh, are not necessarily seeing it as a, a key. Um, that's what they're after. I think there's some maturity that that's still going on in terms of really understanding uh, what is you know why are we transforming, who's it for, what what is the purpose. Um, but I think uh, whether it it uh, comes to light more and as as uh, certain clients and things get educated. Uh, they start to unpack it. And as soon as we get into businesses and show um, what we can do, it, it certainly uh, has its, you know, moment of, you know, realisation that that's a, a great mm. approach. So, mm. uh, where, where are you getting the practitioners from? Are you developing your own or is it well, a, that's a hard one, that, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I, I do find it hard. Uh, I have got some great pe people uh, in our business currently, and and they are gems. They're 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 hard to find, um, but as soon as we find them, we we tend to hold on to them. My our current kind of view is training people up. So bringing people on, training them up is certainly part of what we need to do as our own business and then going into organisations. So I'm really passionate about going in and leaving something behind. I don't, I, I actually want to upskill people, especially working for government departments. They're, they're so big and, and um, they need more of this approach. So the fact that I can go in there and, and almost hunt down those type of people and then take them on the journey and upskill them through the process, I'm really passionate about that. So I'll do that as well. So, but it is hard, and I do I do think life experience is is really important in in some of these roles, and people coming into them with some experience inside business, inside understanding, you know what happens through life, right? You go through moments through life. So we're we're often even with the the work we were doing for the energy company, we're not just looking at customers, we're looking at life journeys and and the moments that you go through life, whether it's you know 
meeting your partner or having kids or going through, you know, the ageing process, it's all really important and there's so many opportunities that businesses can serve uh, human citizens along that journey. So uh, in, in terms of life experience but also business experience is, is really important. Yeah, I can see how that, that, uh, that might make it a little bit hard to find just the right people that so do you find that they uh, they tend to be the types with a higher level of emotional intelligence? Um, depending on what we're employing them for. Mm. Uh, I think we we are very uh, in terms of the way we we like to set up a te our teams is is a um, diverse group of people working together and that not everyone is made, you know, in the same kind of way and being honest about that. We, you know, in terms of engaging with our clients, we certainly do need to provide a good experience for them. So our service that we provide and, and be those good service designers in their own practice, uh, we need to have that um, good uh, human engagement um, ability to engage so it's certainly part of something we we like to bring in but also building that um, in others and and when you know that people have got it in their heart of hearts they're just um, uh, you know introverts that need to come out it, it's finding those, those people that we can we can grow and and bring bring their true um, beautiful selves to life so we we do like to do that too to say that that doesn't necessarily align to some of the architects that I've worked with over the years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you find that you're bringing, you're developing architects in that direction or you're bringing other people in that, and teaching them more of the strategic aspects? Uh, well, we have to do both. Um, mm. Certainly, I uh, some of the architects, and this is why I would say don't don't have five architects in a team. So, you know, you need to throw in a couple of service designers or strategic designers or those people that that um, come from uh, that different different perspective. Whether you know you call them the the creative, but also uh, those people need to be able to anchor to you know in terms of creative side, need to be un able to under understand and anchor to what the architects are trying to do. So we we do. Um, think yes in terms of great architects if that's the way they are in terms of uh, extremely good at, at their job and how they they do it and they need to be partnered with uh, people that are better with the engagement side the the pushing the thinking the creative thinking then that's how I would create the mix um, and often we are going to organizations and there might be a bunch of architects that already exist there so it's about working with them and, and getting the best out of them and being the facilitator of the conversation with the business, with the um, with the architects or the IT people as well. So uh, it is different where we go, but we don't necessarily believe that everyone has to have a full 360 of, you know, their, their analytical and the creative and that they're, that they're perfectly round, rounded humans. We, we're not all made that way so we we try and bring the best out of everyone but um we do know that that some people are really great at some things and not great at others yeah that's a very good point yeah um i'm just uh wondering about the um uh, the the sort of regular cycles associated with the type of work you're doing is there is there a cadence to the way that these activities occur in organizations or is it more of a fluid thing that you're introducing for them? Yeah, so we kind of, we do use uh, sort of agile practices. In some organisations, we, you know, it's very much, you know, you might do the sprint, you know, you're doing your two-week sprints, um, you're doing great planning and so And I, I, my preference is for that uh, to certainly... Um, when when it's really complex in an organisation, you can, you, can uh, you know, do do two week sprints and allow your team members to have sort of uh, that rest time as well so that they can get everything out, know what they're focused on. Uh, so we do use Kanbans, we do use uh, those approaches and certainly with with um, just thinking one of the teams that we're working with at the moment uh, is certainly set up in that way, morning, morning stand-ups, um, uh, getting into that. 
unpacking ourselves like we were an initiative. So, so one of the programs I'm I'm working on, we have uh, an initiative that we have uh, for ourselves, and and the different projects that need to come out of that, and that could be anything from change management through to to business architecture, through to the IT architecture. Uh, so that that um, is formed up in a way that we're going to operate like some of the the delivery teams as well, but we do it slightly differently because we we're not delivering in the same way, and sometimes um, it changes depending on the nature of the organisation and where where you need to. Um, be at the moments at a moment's notice. We're, we're, we've just come off the back of a two-year strategy. We're developing from what, one of the the um, the big um, uh, departments, and and that's still in the process of that uh, uh, engaging, getting people on board with the strategy, uh, getting teams uh, mobilised, and things like that. So we're staying part of that process to really see it through uh, for this particular project. Mm. So, sort of, so there's a, you're using a similar approach in terms of the strategic planning cycles as well as not just initiatives? Uh, yeah, yep, yep. So, certainly, uh, depending on, depending on, uh, when we can get people for workshops and things. So if there's delays in getting, you know, things done, that can push out our work. Uh, but it's certainly, we like to have a cadence and a delivery um, cadence and and where we can bring in a good um, project manager as well to make sure we're, we're on track and we're, we're delivering as well. It's really important that... Uh, Take, taking through a business through that design process, especially if you're developing a strategy, that you're delivering uh, in terms of the timeline is not going to be pushed out too long because that can be exhausting for everyone involved. So really having a great cadence of the engagement and some kind of energy that comes behind it can be a really key part of that change management piece as well, where you're engaging, uh, it could be staff as well through some of the activities we sometimes do. If we're, we're doing a strategy, sometimes you need to um, pull in frontline staff to bring that voice of the customer forward. Uh, so you're you're bringing them through a process and and getting the energy flowing through that they're they're part of the solution and that they're coming forth with some of the solution as as well as the execs and that they can see themselves in that and can be part of that implementation phase as well and that the change is already um, you know forming through the business as you're going. Sounds like you'll need uh, even though you're sort of engaging at the sort of lower levels of the organisation getting, you know, real-world SME experience. You also need executive support to be able to make this work and get the allowances, access to people, that sort of thing. Yeah. So that's happening through the process as well. So often your execs are in that alignment phase early on, getting them on board. They can be part of our um, research pieces and unpacking, but often the staff, um, especially if you, you can't go out, you're often bringing together staff that know stuff about how their business operates. So you do do workshops with them, ideally. Uh, and then it's about often immersing, immersing um, executives in the findings. What have we found out? And then bring those um, staff and execs in for the for the innovation part of the idea generation. How are we going to solve some of these problems? But making sure your um, the roles like the the architects are involved in in in. Um, architecting ideas as well and that we're doing a divergent thinking on what those solutions can be maybe from an experience perspective but maybe it's under the hood what's going on how could we change things so they, they're all uh, it's a complex process but but it's uh, a really important piece that people are brought into to the journey as we go through yes so with that visibility of executive involvement um, you're more likely to be able to have conversations around cultural change in the organisation as well. Yeah, and it's really, really important uh, in any business. The culture side of it is massive. Uh, and depending on the exec engagement, changes in every organisation, whether they're on board or whether, you know, whether they're your advocate and they're cha championing the, 
the process on and and really uh, seeing the opportunity that that even the the, the approach can have uh, for an organisation, but um, sometimes they're not on board. So the culture can be an issue that's that's coming from from above, and and often it is. Uh, so, so what can we do if those, those uh, the culture issues stem from from the executive team? We need to unpack that as well through the process. Any can be part of that that problem solving that we need to do. So, uh, it it can be challenging, but it's also really important to bring these things out through the process. And and that's why we do the alignment. That's why we do the immersion spaces and and things and taking people through it. Yeah, and I really like the idea that you're trying to leave something in the organisation while you're there. Mm. So I've been working with a, a state government department here in Western Australia and uh, and uh, looking at uh, trying to encourage them to use human-centred design with one of the strategy pieces. And uh, and part of that has some baking in of transfer of knowledge from the external party that will run the, the HCD. So that, they can perpetuate it and they can become just part of the yeah. way that they do it. Yeah. 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 It's um it, it's really important. It can be challenging in terms of embedding it uh, and making sure that they've got reach back into that business, I think, to get guidance and, and coaching through it. Uh, I think it, it, it as long as they're embedded long enough to 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 leave some of that that thinking and that approach and and some of it's in the ways of working as they they exit the business really important but so powerful i had to ask this question but uh how do, how do you go with the relationships with the uh the finance team and the procurement team well what's what's um is this in terms of the output and investments in what we're doing? In, or, invest, or, investments, yeah. Yeah. And and, yeah. And, so, and activities so related to procurement, yeah. yeah. Um, what's really, uh, I think, powerful with this whole approach is that you've got evidence. So you start to build evidence of why, around why you're making decisions. So it's not just uh, an assessment over a capability that someone's Oh, that's that's rated this. We're actually applying the research and the evidence to the capability that then if you do, you know, if you've got your knowledge base and you, you track that really well or you've got some other research repository um, happening inside the business, you can see why. And actually having what's really important, especially big um, government agencies where they've got to prove why they why they spent such and such a million dollars you know citizens of australia want to know you can show that from a current state like where do we where were the problems across the business where can we show on our capability map but underneath the hood of that that rating what is it you know have we got evidence have we got like data that we actually got and we heard from people and they said a thing and we knew that this thing was failing. And then, then we can talk to, well, that's why we invested in that uplift of that um, workflow tool. And we can talk, we can create traceability back to the customer experience and we can visually show that that problem here for, for your citizen that's trying to use my service or my, your customer where now we want to push that up and we want to change that. We want to measure that experience and tracing that back to that capability. And we we, we knew we needed to do it here because there was failings in the business and proving that out is really powerful. And so you need to, you need to have rigour around your process, but you need to be able to uh, get those invest, um, those people, the finance people who I'm in the current project, we're very connected up in terms of understanding and what we're, what we're trying to achieve. And it's really um, important because then they have faith in the process. They also have the evidence. And when, when the, when someone comes knocking, treasury comes knocking, you can, you can pull that out and say, well, we did this because of this. And, and we actually measured the benefit and the benefit is we're going to, you know, give all this time back to, you know, businesses in Australia and they're going to be able to get back to the business of doing what they do, which is maybe producing prod produce or something, and they're going to spend less time with the department. Or equally on the other side, if it's a, um, it's a, it's a 
you know, commercial business, they can say, ah, oh, we're, getting, we're getting customers to spend more time with us. That means that they're going to spend more dollars inside of our shop and our investment into this thing has increased sales by this much. From a, from a, a um, government perspective, it slightly changes. You don't want stickiness in your business. So, That's yeah, interesting it's interesting because there's... Yeah, yeah, it's a, the, there's a sort of a perception, I guess, that the, um, the approach of experimentation has uh, uh, inherent risk in it, but uh, the way you're explaining it, it's actually giving you more information to mitigate risk mm. because you're getting to an outcome faster so you can determine whether or not it was a good idea before you commit the $10 million, $20 million, $100 million to the program yeah. and, uh, and then wait for it to fail. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, going back to that sort of innovation or the idea generation. So I, I, um, I teach people to be creative. So I, I've been lecturing uh, at University of Ca Canberra in their creative um, thinking masters course. So we're now trying to inject the the creative thinking back into masters students which should be, you know, part of our schooling system. And I know that was brought up earlier. It's ridiculous. We, we should be teaching our children at a very early age, or not even teaching, allowing them to be who they are, allowing them to be that creative person so they can bring them into our businesses of the future. Because now we need people to be creative. We actually want people. So I often challenge, you know, teams to, to think, okay, I don't want five ideas. I want 500. So we're going to use techniques in you pushing the boundaries of your thinking using different design thinking techniques. And we're going to imagine ourselves in the future, or imagine your business in the future, or imagine your, your customers or staff in the future. And how does that look? And how are we going to change that? And what are the things that we can come up with? And using that aligned to our problem statements allows us to push that to the boundaries and do that divergent thinking. So if we think about the five ideas, you might come up with, you know, something that looks okay, or let's do that. Let's invest, you know, five million in that that thing because someone likes it as well as an idea. Or we could do 500 ideas, take that information, synthesise it down into 15 really interesting well thought out concepts we can build out some lean canvases of what those potential could be we can do some study into those and work out the benefits that we'll get from those and then we can know if we want to invest in them or not so it's a different yeah. story that is that's that's very good that's a very good uh, contrast and comparison there was another question in the q a but um, it turns out we just answered that through that conversation so that's oh, all good sorry. um just um just because it is the we are takes over built uh, conference um tell me about the uh the gender balance in your organization uh 50 50 at the moment um right. we uh, yeah, we just like to be, I don't think I've overthought it. Um, we just, we mm. just ended up that way. Um, but yeah. it's certainly, uh, something really important that more women get into tech, uh, and, and moving into that space. Uh, I've worked with amazing, uh, service design in human centered designers, male, male human centered designers, amazing, both fe mm. male, female. So uh, I think that that's a fairly balanced space, but certainly getting into, you know, um, you know, some of some of the schools and making sure that that girls get interested in tech is really important, and and certainly an avenue through the human centred approach, I think, is a really interesting avenue for for women as well, and a lot of women who have had life experiences, who have had. Uh, amazing careers doing different things, whether it's marketing, whether it's, um, uh, you know, uh, psychology or or different design, industrial designers, amazing people uh, moving across. And I am seeing a lot of those people coming through the HCD side of things. So that's certainly um, an avenue, but, but um, certainly bringing um, girls in from from our schools and teaching them, you know, getting them interested early. What is going to yeah. make them interested in tech and how can they have yeah. a career along that path? So 
uh, it's right. a, it, we'll see what happens in the next few years. Right. Fantastic. Well, Fran, thank you for, for coming on and sharing all of that with us today. It was great. It's been um, fun. We'll probably talk to you for another hour, but, um, but uh, we'll another time. On, be but... great, Dale. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you very much, Fran. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Have a good weekend.